Continental drift. Guys, at this point you really kind of need to focus because there's some really important things here and you uh, having headphones is not going to help you. Mm. Okay. Continental drift theory. Now, I don't know, like, when I was a little kid, I always looked at a globe like, wow, this is so cool. It looks like Africa and South America should be together, but they're not. If we, like, push them back together, they fit. You guys ever look at, at globes and think that? No. <laughs> Specifically, the Atlantic Ocean, okay? Now, there was another guy who also thought this. His name was Alfred... Wegener, a uh, German name, so that's why I always say the W with a V, because that's how Germans say their Ws. So Alfred Wegener, uh, Wegener, much easier to say. Well, he said, you know what, everything used to be put back together, the way it looks. And I'm going to call that everything put back together, or one giant continent. Let's call it Pangea. Which means all the land put back together. Mary, control yourself or sit in the hall. I just said Ooh. Okay. And this is what the kind of the idea was. Okay, here we have Africa, South America. If you put them back together, they fit really well. Now, you might notice that, well, what is this light blue section? What that is, is the continental shelf. Write this in your notes. The continental shelf is the area of the continental crust that's underwater. Continental shelf is continental crust underwater. Why is it underwater? Because the ocean at that this time is high. The oceans have not always been this high. The sea level goes up and down based off how much ice we have on the planet. You have more ice on the continent, you have less water in the ocean. Less ice on the continent, more water in the ocean. So if the Greenland ice cap melts, or if Antarctica melts, what will happen is New York City will be underwater. Alexandria will be permanently underwater. New Orleans is already underwater. Okay, so that, that is why we have continental shelf that you can't necessarily see because the ocean's in the way, but it's there. So this is how it all fits together. Questions about kind of how this fits together? Okay. That seems to be pretty simple. Now, Wegener didn't just say it fits together, he did some research. And he went looking. And he noticed that there are fossils all over the place. Zach, Jessica, stop talking. There are fossils all over the place. For example, Mesosaurus is a water reptile. Um, that's what you picture. Water reptile. Okay, so here's Mesosaurus, here's Lystrosaurus, and Glossopteris is a plant. So here we have a uh, water reptile, big thing that looks like a walrus. I have no idea what this looks like. Um, and we have what's sort of like a fern. Okay? Now, what I want you to see, so what, what the previous slide is, is just telling you where all these are, is that fossils of these, or the dead remains, the, or the dead imprint of these creatures that have been captured in the rocks, have been found to match. So here we have Glossopteris in Australia, Antarctica, India, Africa, and South America in these really nice, neat, clean bands, along with Lystrosaurus, Mesosaurus, and there's other things, fossils out there. I've just given you the highlights of the big three. Okay? So do you kind of get what the evidence is? He's like, not only do the continents fit together, but it looks like they were all put together because this plant easily spread across these continents in a nice, connecting, puzzle piece fitting way. Does that make sense, Mary? Okay. So this is one of the first piece of evidence is that the fossil record matches across the continents. Okay? There's another piece of evidence. Rock types. Mountain belts. 
Well, we haven't got to how mountain belts are formed yet. That'll be one of our last discussions. But let me tell you about mountains. They don't form randomly. So here we have four different mountain sections. The Appalachians, I hope you know where they are. The British Isles, where do we find the British Isles? Great Britain. Okay, that crazy islands north of Europe. Then we have the Caledonian Mountains. These are a little bit harder. Who knows what the Caledonians are? Caledonia. No, not Caledonia. The Caledonian Mountains are the mountain ranges of Norway, Sweden, and Finland. The Scandinavian Mountains. Why do they call it the Appalachians? Someone just did. Okay. And then you have the Atlas Mountains. Does anyone know where the Atlas Mountains are? They're in Greece. They are in Morocco. Morocco, so West Africa. Thank you. Okay. So let's look at this. So here we have these different locations. So here we have the Atlas Mountains are here, the British Isles, the Caledonian Mountains are up in Scandinavia, the Appalachian Mountains come down here. Guess what? This is the same mountain range. They're, this, they're folded thrust belt mountains of the same rock type, and we can do tests and determine these are the same stinking rocks. They were formed at the same time, the same way, the same extension. And if you look at when Pangea was put together, that's when this mountain belt formed. And when everything, so according to Wegener, split apart, these mountain ranges got ripped apart. So the first piece of evidence is fossils match. Second piece of evidence is the mountains match. So this makes sense. It looks like everything was put together because even the mountains fit into place in this awesome puzzle piece making way. Okay? You guys have questions on fossils or mountains so far? No? Okay. I don't like to think this is hard. Okay. Third piece of evidence. Climates. Okay. We have glaciers and deposits of glaciers, glacial striations, glacial grooves, blah, blah, blah. We have glacier stuff where there shouldn't be glacier stuff. Okay. If you look at Africa, this part of Africa is Somalia, okay, or actually what would be left of it, and then maybe this would be the savanna, and yet we have glacial evidence in areas where it doesn't snow. This, I mean, right here is the modern day equator through South America and Africa. This would be the temperate zone. You don't get glaciers here. But yet we find evidence of glaciers in a really awesome pattern, like here, glaciers in India. India is not known for being a cold place. How about Australia? Very hot desert place. Okay, so here we have, not only do we have fossil evidence that matches, we have mountains that match, and then we have glacier evidence that matches. So three really strong pieces of evidence that support continental drift theory proposed by Alfred Wegener. Okay? Did the scientific community say, hey, look at all this great evidence. You must be right. What'd they say? Dude, you are on crack. Okay. They rejected his hypothesis and were kind of aggressive against him and shut him down, said you are the stupidest person in the world. This can't happen. Doesn't work. Why? Uh, uh, hold on. Here's how... Wegener said what happened. It started to split apart, split apart, split apart. There we go. Why don't they like it? Very simple. There's no mechanism to make it work. Okay. Now, we're talking about Alfred Wegener when he proposed this in the mid-20th century. They had no evidence to show how it would work. This would be like saying, uh, Cameron looking at me, I've got a car that goes 100 miles an hour, and I go look at his car, and it's got no engine in it. And I'm going to say, I'm sorry, I know you're saying your car goes 100 miles an hour, you've got a speedometer that goes up to 100 miles an hour, you've got wheels that can go 100 miles an hour, but there's no engine in the car, it's not moving. Because there was no way, we're saying that these continents just slide through the oceans, 
that they didn't understand there's no way to make it happen, so they said, no, you're done, go away. So continental drift was absolutely, utterly rejected. They didn't like it, go away, it doesn't work. Okay? Okay, so we have continental, that's the first thing we're talking about, continental drift theory. And I'm done with it. I'll go back for a second. Sorry. Okay. This was Alfred Wegener. I'm going to start you on a story. This story began in the uh, 1930s, the late 1930s. There was a, a gentleman by the name of Adolf Hitler who decided to try to take over all of Europe. Okay. And there was another uh, gen gentleman, the Emperor of Japan, who decided to take over the other side of the earth. Okay. And that propelled us into what? World War II. World War II. Now, one of the big things about World War II, one of the big things about World War II was naval battles. Because you have all, you know, we have these battles occurring across the whole globe. If we want to get food, medicine, uniforms, tanks, guns, cots, whatever, to Europe or to Hawaii, we have to ship it there. And all this shipping, created targets for what we call an Unterseeboot, or a U-boat. U-boats were uh, very early submarines, and they sunk, actually, the U.S. submarine force sunk one-third of Japanese fleet and Japanese shipping. One-third. Now, I'm going to give you a note. That's being cut, and that is even with the fact that our torpedoes were cracked. The torpedoes we had didn't work right. The detonators didn't go off every time they hit something. So you'd probably say, you know, maybe a third to half of their torpedoes didn't even explode when they hit something. And this was with rather primitive, according to today's standards, of naval warfare. So, now we've got a problem. All of the ships that we're trying to send across the oceans are getting sunk by submarines, both German and Japanese alike. And we have our own submarines who are fighting their submarines and fighting their shipping. So you have this giant kind of complex naval war. Well, what does that tell some scientists in the military? Wouldn't it, if you have these boats that are underwater, wouldn't it be wise to start studying what it looks like underwater? So they started sending across, as uh, the ships went across the ocean, they started mapping what the ocean looked like. And they used sonar. So sonar is sound, navigation, and ranging. So not sound, navigation, ranging. Sonar, very simple. It sends off an electrical pulse, not electrical, I apologize, um, a sound pulse. It hits whatever is down there, and it bounces back. So it could be another submarine, it could be a whale, or it could be the ocean floor, and you'll get what the ocean floor looks like. So as these ships were going across the ocean, they were taking pictures with sonar to use the, that phrase, of what the ocean floor looked like. Now, whose data was this? This was military data. They weren't exactly releasing this to the Germans because they didn't want the Germans to know what it looked like. They didn't want the Japanese to know what it looked like. It was top secret information. Well, after the war, uh, some of the people in charge of this program, one of them, uh, his name's Henry Hess, goes on to be some huge professor that discovers the, the theory of sea floor spreading, said, hey, Look at that! The ocean floor is doing something really cool! Now, they weren't thinking geology at the time, they were thinking submarines at the time. But what did they find? They found deep sea trenches and mid ocean ridges and some other stuff, but we're just going to go with the two big ones here. Now, this is important. A deep sea trench is an extremely deep ocean canyon, right? Or a gorge, or an area where the ocean is like this. And if you go down to the bottom of it, you're talking 11 kilometers deep. Well, a 5K is 3.1 miles, so 10K is 6.2 miles or so. So this is 6 to 7 miles deep underwater. This is seriously deep. Okay. Uh, the Marianas Trench is 11 kilometers deep, and it's not even the deepest one. The Challenger Deep, I think, is deeper. Where do we find most of our trenches? The Pacific. Okay, in the Atlantic Ocean, they found something really cool. It's called the Mid-Ocean Ridge. They found that there is a giant line of mountains, literally mountains, 
running from the North Atlantic all the way to the South Atlantic, splitting the Atlantic like a giant <coughs> zipper on a coast. Uh, and they found that all of these ridges were connected. So they started to do some thinking, wait a second, wait a second. Mr. Henry Hess says, what is the ocean doing? Well, here's some other stuff that they found. They also discovered that the ocean crust is made of basalt. It's basalt. We've learned about basalt. What is basalt? Uh, it's basalt. It's what? Basalt. It's basalt. Okay. It's an igneous rock that's extrusive and mafic. Okay. Now, we know that this basalt, we know now, that the basalt forms when the magma melts, comes to the surface, and hardens. Okay. Now, here's something else we discovered. Okay, if you have the ocean, and you have your mid-ocean ridge in the middle, we also notice that as you get toward the continents on the side, so this would be like the U.S., and this would be Europe, going away from the mid-ocean ridge, you have very thick layers of sediment. And the further away you get, the thicker the sediments get on both sides. Okay, so as you get farther and farther away from the center of the ocean, the sediment gets thicker and thicker and thicker. How does the sediment form? Well, stuff falls down, dirt gets into the water, settles out, animal carcasses die, settle out, lots of ways. We get to oceanography, we'll talk more about this. But it was interesting, why is there thinner sediment toward the ridge and thicker sediment away from the ridge? Like, hmm, they're starting to put two and two together. You guys kind of getting what's going on yet? Okay. Well, it didn't take them long to, to figure this out, that the sea is actually spreading in certain areas. And they came up with a theory, uh, Henry Hess came up with a theory, that the sea floor is spreading. So it's sea floor spreading theory. So as our learning target says, we're going to understand continental drift theory and sea floor spreading. Okay. Sea floor spreading basically states that new ocean floor is forming at the mid-ocean ridges. Magma is coming up, it's forcing the crust apart, it's making new crust, new crust, new crust, the plates are moving apart. Okay, so the idea was that the sea floor is spreading. It's kind of an early idea, but the sea floor is spreading. So I'm saying sea floor spreading a lot, hoping that you guys remember this term. Are we good with this term? Dietrich, you good with this term? Okay. Okay. They also, okay, along that, so we figured out the mid ocean ridges are volcanoes. Does this only happen in the ocean? Tell me, guys, does this only happen in the ocean? No. No, this also happens on land. African Rift Valley, the Culpeper Basin. Wait a second, have you guys heard the, the term or the name Culpeper before? Yes. Yeah. Does that sound really far away or really close? Close. It's really close. We live on the outskirts, Woodbridge is on the outskirts of the Culpeper Basin. Okay, so the Culpeper Basin is an area of very ancient rifting. Okay, we're going to get more into rifting later. Right now I want you to just really focus on the seafloor being ripped apart and new magma coming out. Well, if seafloor is being made, where does the other seafloor go? Okay. Okay, like what comes up, what must come down? You can't... I've heard a lot of people say, you can't buy one more thing to put in the garage until you throw away something else that's in the garage to make room for what's it, what you need in the garage. Okay, so same thing's going on with the ocean crust here. As we're making more and more crust, that's pushing the crust in another direction, and it crashes into other crust. Who wins? The bottom. Okay. Which crust is more dense? The ocean crust or the continent crust? Remember this from last time? The ocean. 
The ocean crust is more dense. So which is going to win in a battle of king of the hill? The ocean or the continent? The continent. Yes. I'm not talking that table. Okay. So here we have crust forming, crust dying. Forming, dying. Look, here's a mid-ocean ridge. Volcanoes where it's forming. Here's a trench. So this is where the crust is dying. And why is it so deep? Well, you have one piece of crust here, one piece of crust here. They're butting heads. One of them wins. And what you have, if you can see between my fist and my arm, that's that little deep section. That is the trench. So this trench here, the Marianas Trench, the Challenger Deep, a lot of these different trenches, this is where we see the crust getting pushed under. Okay? What was that? No, because there's always new crust. And there's always, and always new crust forming, always old crust dying. Okay? And what this mainly makes is volcanoes. Okay, it makes volcanoes here, it makes volcanoes here, but they're two completely different types of volcanoes. We're gonna talk about that in the next couple of days. Or next couple of classes. Okay? This is where I got with last class. Okay. Now so, seafloor spreading was discovered uh, in World War II, after World War II, based off all of the evidence of the sonar research of the ocean floor. We discovered that at the mid-ocean ridges, the ocean is separating, and at the uh, trenches, the ocean, uh, the ocean crust is being destroyed. Do you guys have, are you guys with me so far? Okay. That's the theory. How do we prove it? How do we prove it? We need to talk about evidence for seafloor spreading. Now, the first piece of evidence is paleomagnetism. Big, long word. Let's break it down. So we have a prefix, the main word, and the, and the suffix, the ending. Okay, magnet. Please tell me you guys know what a magnet is. Yes. Okay, magnet, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a piece of uh, iron that has a magnetic field, something like that. Well, magnetism is applying that magnetic field to an object. It has magnetism. Does that make sense? So what's, if this is easy, you guys seem to know what this is. What's paleo mean? Does it mean earth? It means ancient. Very good. Ancient. You guys all good with what ancient means? Okay. What do you mean? Ancient, extremely old rock. So if you say something is paleo, we're talking about extremely old ancient magnets of rocks. So paleomagnetism is how do the rocks how do the how do the rocks act magnetically? Ancient rocks. Okay. Maybe you guys have heard of a study called paleontology. Yeah, okay, either. that's the study of ancient dinosaur bones. Okay, paleomagnetism. Now, do you guys agree that the Earth is one giant magnet? Yes. Yes. You should. Okay, the Earth is one giant magnet. Remember from our discussion of layers of the Earth? What layer of the Earth causes our magnet? The the outer core and the and the inner core. The inner core is spinning, and it's made of iron and nickel. And the differential spinning creates our our uh, magnetic field. Well, our magnetic field can be easily measured. Has anyone ever used a compass? Yes. Okay. If you're using a compass and you're trying to get around, there's true north, and then there's the magnetic north. Yeah. The, mag the North Pole is not exactly at the Earth's true North Pole. It's kind of off. So we can measure the lines of magnet uh, magnetism on the Earth, our magnetic field. Well, here's something neat. What mineral or what metal is in basalt rock that makes it mafic? Uh, mm -hmm. Iron. So if we have a lot of basaltic lava, <laughs> 
Basaltic lava has lots of iron. What are magnets made of? What mineral? Iron-based minerals. So here we have this magnetic, friendly lava, basalt, cooling. And as it cools, it goes from liquid state to solid state. Agreed? I mean, this is all basic stuff, right? Well, what is a magnet? A magnet is any rock where all the particles, or any metal or substance, where all the particles are lined up in one direction. Do you guys remember that from junior high? Middle school. Junior high, middle school, depends on what part of the country. Okay. Okay. So here we have rocks that are developing a weak magnetic field based on what the magnetic field of the Earth is. Now you, you ask me, why does this matter? Why do I care? A lot of you guys are already drifting off into your slumber of waking dreams. Okay. The thing is, Earth's magnetic poles, North Pole, South Pole, do not stay North Pole, South Pole. Okay? The magnetic poles flip back and forth. And it goes seemingly at random. We don't know. There's no like, okay, every 100,000 years. We don't know. Sometimes it's 100,000 years. Sometimes it's 300,000 years. So here we have uh, 400,000 years ago, 800,000 years ago, 1.2 uh, million years ago. Okay. So every now and again, our polarity shifts. Do the volcanoes ever stop forming? No. No. See, here you have a volcano that's been forming for a couple of million years. And we can see the different layers of hardened lava, or the basalt rock, and we can measure its magnetic field, and we see, look at that. The South Pole was the South Pole was one way, the South Pole's the other way. The South Pole was one way, the South Pole's the other way. And we can actually date the layers based off their magnetic field. Ancient magnetism. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. This is very important. If you don't get paleomagnetism, you need to tell me or come after school and tell me. Give you tons of worksheets until you understand it. You have to understand this concept. Okay. Why do you have to understand this concept? Well, at a mid-ocean ridge, what kind of rock is being formed? Starts with a B. Basalt. Basalt has a lot of what mineral? Iron. Iron. Okay. So do you think at the mid-ocean ridge, these volcanoes will have a record of what the Earth's <laughs> poles are doing? Yes. Okay. So here we have the North Pole is up, South Pole is down. Here we have the North Pole is down, the South Pole is up. And because... The seafloor is expanding equally on both sides, for the most part. We can see this record in the crust. Okay. Now we have a different length of period. So North Pole normal, North Pole reverse. North Pole normal, North Pole reverse. Or something along those lines. Okay. So we start to see these, these stripes in these mid-ocean ridges that show the reversing polarity of the planet. Does that make sense? Okay. What does this seem to say to you? Why does this side match that side? Yeah, because it's equally different. This is proving that the seafloor is actually spreading. Okay? So this is why the book asks the question, why are the magnetized strips about equal width on either side of the ridge? Right? Because this is proving that the seafloor is spreading. This is why I put this under evidence for seafloor spreading. This is your last day together, guys. Okay. So first thing was evidence was paleomagnetism. So you should write down in your notes, evidence for seafloor spreading, paleomagnetism. Your second piece of evidence for seafloor spreading are earthquake patterns. Earthquake patterns. Okay. Now, seafloor spreading with paleomagnetism does a really good job of showing how the ridges spread apart. But they're not as helpful with trenches. 
So what are we going to use for the trenches to understand the trenches? Well, we're going to use these earthquake patterns. Okay, here we go. I've got two pictures to explain this. Here we have the key to our map. Shallow earthquakes are blue, intermediate or almost deep earthquakes are green, and the really deep earthquakes are red. Here we have the Japanese islands. Here we have the trench around the Japanese islands. Way over here in the Pacific, there's a mid-ocean ridge, and it's pushing the ocean crust this direction and down into the trench. How do we know it's going down? Can you look at the chart and figure it out? How do we know? Because the elevation. Because the earthquakes that we see from the ground shifting get deeper and deeper and deeper the further away from the trench that we get. Do you guys see this? Yes. Okay. This is a, a little bit easier picture to see. As the crust is coming this way, we see shallow earthquakes close to the trench. The further away we get from the trench, we're getting these intermediate, and then we get these really deep earthquakes. And we don't get tons of these because the deeper you go, the crust becomes more uh, uh, ductile. It, it moves better, and then eventually you just don't see the earthquakes anymore because the earth just slides back and forth like the hot wax. Okay? Do you guys see this? So do you see evidence for C4 spreading being paleomagnetism and then these earthquake locations at the trenches. Okay? Does that make sense, Elisha? I should wake up. Okay. All right, the final piece of evidence for C4 spreading. So we had paleomagnetism, earthquake locations, Final piece of evidence for sea floor spreading is the age of the floor. Okay? We can test and determine how old the ocean floor is. Remember how I said the sediment layers were getting thicker the further away you go? That's one way of determining. Here's the mid-ocean ridge. And that is between zero and two million years old. And on both sides, it matches getting older and older and older until it gets to the continental shelf on the other side. Okay? The seafloor is spreading, and it's obviously spreading if you just look at a chart of the ages. So here we have these uh, East Pacific rise, where this is a mid-ocean ridge in the, in the Pacific, pushing the continent of uh, the, the ocean this way, and here's what we were looking at before with Japan. Really, really old crust going under Japan. Okay? Paleomagnetism, showing how the different magnetic stripes here and here. And then you have uh, the location of earthquakes as the earthquakes get deeper and deeper and deeper in a subduction zone. And then you have, well, just the age of the seafloor tends to show that the seafloor is actually spreading. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. I'm glad Alexis thinks that makes sense. Does anyone else think this makes sense? Yes. No. Okay. And that's all I have for that. When we come back...